Hi, this is Mike from Mike's Unboxing Reviews and How To, and today we've got a B550 motherboard. This is the ASRock B550 Phantom Gaming 4. Keep watching to find out more. Okay, so this is the first of the B550 boards to cross the threshold here at Mike's Unboxing, and this is the ASRock Phantom Gaming 4. This is a budget board, by no mistake, it is at the moment in the UK around about £110. Obviously, that price will change depending on when you're watching this video. But as of now, in August 2020, you can pick this up for about £110, which is actually a pretty good deal in my opinion. You get most of the good features of the B550 chipset, but you don't get all of the niceties, such as those inbuilt IO shields and all those kinds of things. But anyway, we'll take a tour of the box, we'll take it out of the packaging, go through all the motherboard connections, and then I'll give you my thoughts on the board at the end of the video. So first of all, starting with the packaging, pretty much standard affair for motherboards these days, pretty jazzy. The Phantom Gaming range from ASRock, if you're not sure what it is, is actually part of their kind of gaming brand and is pretty much a take on the tough version that you get from ASUS. So you can get other peripherals and components which have the Phantom Gaming logos, in-wind chassis for one, and there's a few other bits and pieces on the market. If you want to find out more about those, there will be links in the video description so you can check them out for yourself. But anyway, so the Phantom Gaming uh, logos, all that kind of stuff, usual kind of affair. On the front, it talks about HDMI, polychrome sync, so this is a RGB board and it is actually loaded with RGB, not actually on the board itself, but tons and tons of connectivity. Also, it supports AMD Ryzen third generation processors, so these are Ryzen 3000 processors, not to be confused with the Ryzen 3000 APUs, that is a different thing altogether, and if you want to see the full compatibility list of what processors this board will support, I'll leave that in the video description also. So it is using the AMD B550 chipset, pretty much says what it is on the tin. Looking around at the back, it goes into more detail about the individual components and we've got a nice clear shot of the motherboard and all of its goodies. Also we get a specifications list and also a look at the rear IO, which is pretty minimal. It also goes on to talk about the Nahimic audio, or Nahimic, I'm not even sure how you pronounce that, but essentially it's pretty decent audio, and it's based around the Realtek ALC1200 chipset. Also we've got Hyper M.2 for SSD, so essentially that means PCI Express 4, if you've got a drive that supports it. Also, Polychrome Sync, we've got both 12 volt and 5 volt addressable RGB headers. We've got a really nice feature, which is the post status checker. So unlike some of the cheaper boards on the market, this one actually has a status or debug LED. So when you're building your system, if for some reason you don't get a post or you don't get anything on your screen, then you've got some really handy dandy LEDs, which will tell you what the problem is, whether it's CPU, RAM, etc., etc. which is really nice, especially for those novice builders. We've got some reinforced slots on the board. So the PCI Express 4 for the graphics card is a reinforced slot. Also got an M.2 uh, E style key for Wi-Fi, so if you want to add Wi-Fi to this board, you can do with a simple card. You can actually get this particular board in the AC Wi-Fi version, which is a little bit more expensive. You're going to pay about another £15, but depending whether you need Wi-Fi or not, that is down to you, but it's certainly an option. Also, it says about the Super Alloy, basically it's got a layer of 2 ounce copper between the PCB just to separate all the layers. So that's pretty much it for the box itself. Let's take a dive inside. So this is going to be a pretty limited uh, setup in here. So first of all, we have got the instruction manual or user guide and it's uh, pretty comprehensive I've had a look through there lots and lots of information in there you get a standard IO shield nothing to get excited about there get some SATA cables SATA 6 gigabits per second or SATA 3 whichever way you want to look at it get a driver DVD and there's three screws for fixing in M.2 style drives or NVMEs so this is the board itself, and I actually really like the look of this board. It's relatively minimal, there's not really a lot going on, you don't have all those fancy shields and plastic covers, and in a lot of cases, sometimes those plastic covers can actually hinder performance, such as blocking airflow around those really important VRM areas. So for me, this actually works out really well. Also again, it reduces the price, which for me is fantastic. Colour scheme on this, really nice, you've got blacks, you've got greys, and you've got aluminium, so it all ties in really nicely relatively neutral, so if you're going for some kind of colourful build, no problems there, and if you're going for a slightly muted build, again, not going to be a problem. This board is making use of pretty much the full width of the standard ATX layout, and you will need all nine of your motherboard standoffs in use, technically ten, because there is an additional support just here, just below where the graphics card area is, so this is going to use ten pillars in total, but you can get away with nine. So let's go for a quick tour around the board and see what connectivity we've got and discuss some of the connections. 
So in this top corner, we've got our CPU supplementary power, and we've got an eight pin, and we've also got a four pin. You don't need to use the four pin. That really is for very, very extreme overclocking, which to be completely honest, this board is not intended for that. The VRM setup on this is relatively limited. It is a eight phase VRM, which is running as a six plus two. So we've got six phases for the CPU and two phases for the SOC. So it's not a really low end board with those really minimal phases. You have got a reasonably good chance of getting some overclocks on again, Ryzen 3s, Ryzen 5s, and maybe even Ryzen 7s if you're lucky. Talking of the VRMs, you've got this chunky heatsink on here. Not as big as we're used to seeing on some of the other boards, like your Tomahawks and things like that from MSI, but certainly appears to be covering all the important components. And if you're using a downdraft cooler, this is going to stay nice and cool. I am not going to be doing any testing in this particular video. We will be doing some long-term testing with this board, and this board is actually going to end up in the PC behind me and going to be in constant use. So I will be updating this video with my results and overclocking findings, all that kind of thing. So if you want to find out how all that goes, don't forget to click on the subscribe button and also the chime icon, and you'll be notified of future video releases. So moving around along the top of the board, we've also actually got a CPU fan header in this top corner here, which is actually quite an unusual one, but quite good if you're using maybe a radiator or you've got rear mounted fans and you don't fancy having the wires trailing into this area here, you can clean up your wiring and have a connection there. All of the headers on this board are suitable for use with either a fan, a water pump or whatever you choose. They are pretty much auto sensing or you can go into the BIOS and actually choose what the type of connection is and set it accordingly, either PWM or DC voltage controlled. Moving along, we've got our main CPU header here, which is ideally in the right place, just above the CPU layout. And this is a standard socket for AM4. Just to clarify, this does not support officially 1000 or 2000 series AMD AM4 CPUs. There is a chance that your CPU may work and may post, but it is not intended to be used with this board. This board is intended for use with 3000 CPUs and 4000 APUs and forthcoming 4000 processors and possibly 5000 APUs. If you're in any way in any doubt of what CPUs this supports, again, do look in the video description. There will be links there and you can see exactly what is supported and that will be updated constantly. So as new CPUs are added, it will be added to the list. So moving across, we've got four slots for RAM and this actually supports up to DDR4733 megahertz. That is pretty insane for a B550 board, especially a budget board. Most people, I think, when building a system are most likely to go with something like a Ryzen 3 3100 or a Ryzen 5 3600 and maybe some DDR 3600 megahertz RAM, which is going to be pretty much that sweet spot. But as things move on and as processors evolve, we will be able to use faster RAM, which is excellent news. So moving further into this top corner, we've got two headers here, one of which is the white header, which is for your 12 volt RGB. And underneath that, we've got a connection for the three pin five volt addressable RGB. Again, both of those are usable either from your BIOS or with the Polychrome Sync software. Moving down, we've got our standard 24 pin power connector and beneath that, we've got our USB 3.0 front panel header. Moving across slightly, we've got PCI Express Gen 4 times 16 slot. So a little bit of future proof in there. At the moment, as we know, graphics cards aren't really saturating the PCI Express Gen 3, but as things move on, as in undoubtedly they will do, hopefully we'll be ready for it. Slightly further along, there is another chassis fan or case fan header, which you can use there. Again, it's a four pin one, controllable in BIOS or software. Underneath the PCI Express, we've got a Hyper M.2 slot. So this is to take advantage of those PCIe Gen 4 NVMe drives to get the latest and greatest speeds on them. There isn't a cooler for the drive itself, which is a little bit of a shame. Also because of the positioning of it, it is gonna be underneath your graphics card. So it is gonna be hidden away a little bit. But in my experience using some of these cheaper boards, it hasn't been a problem as yet. Moving down a little bit further, we've got our M.2 Wi-Fi. So this is using the E-Key style. And again, you can pick up these relatively cheaply on places like Amazon, all that kind of thing. So if you wanted to add Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, you can do with an Intel device, which will plug in there. And again, is installed in the same way as a normal M.2 drive. So moving back across this way, we've got our BIOS chip, which is located here, and which is a nice feature on these ASRock boards. They actually tell you which BIOS is pre-installed from the factory. Now the latest version for this particular board is version P1.10, and that is the one which is installed. So that's excellent. We're ready to go straight out of the box with the Ryzen 3 3100 and pretty much all of the 3000 series chips. Again, links for those will be in the video description. So moving down a little bit more. So we've got our Phantom Gaming logo here on our IO bridge, 
just to keep things nice and cool. And it's nice to see that there isn't a fan necessary on the chipset. B550 boards generally don't need that at all. And I'll be surprised if I see any manufacturers actually adding one. So this is nice to see if you want those ultra quiet systems. On this side, we've got six of our SATA ports. So this is where there's some differences on versions of this board. There are a few different alternatives of this one in the Phantom Gaming range. There's the AC version, which actually has the Wi-Fi built in, but oddly, you lose two of your SATA ports. So do be careful in choosing which board you want. Make sure you get the one with the right ports and the right features for you. If you've got any comments or questions, obviously let us know in the comments below, or alternatively, you can join our Discord chat and we can help you out there. Moving across, we've got a PCI Express Gen 3 times one port there. So a little bit of a step up from the B450s, whereas then that would have been a Gen 2 port. Now it's a Gen 3, so you get the benefits associated with that. So if you're a streamer, maybe you've got a capture card, this can be fantastic for that. You've also got another Time 16 slot there. Again, that is PCI Express Gen 3, not Gen 4. But this does allow you to use Crossfire should you be mad enough to want to use it. But the option's there if you want to. Of course, you can use that slot for other devices. Again, capture cards, all those kinds of things. Maybe some kind of fancy raid card if that uh, floats your boat. Again, the choice is yours. The options are there. It's nice to have it available than not have it at all. Moving down a bit further, we've got another PCI Express Gen 3 times one port. And then also we've got another PCI Express Gen 3 times two socket for MVME or M.2 SATA based drives. Next up is one of my favorite features. Now this is the D-LEDs on the bottom here. So again, if you're having problems with your PC, you've attached everything, you've put all your cables in, you press that power button and you don't get anything on your screen and you're not sure what the heck is going on, you can use those D-LEDs to work out what is going on. They will cycle through. Once your system's booted, those will stay off so there's no distracting lights after the boot process. Now moving down to the bottom, we've got tons of IO here. So yeah, lots and lots of connections, nicely all at the bottom. So cable management should be pretty easy in most setups. So usual place at the bottom, we've got our panel for the IO. So your reset switch, power LED, all that kind of stuff. Next to that, you've got your speaker connection. And also there is a chassis stroke fan header. Moving across slightly, we've got our CMOS reset. Again, if you're into overclocking and you want to make life a little bit easier, rather than wiring your reset switch to your IO panel, you can wire your reset switch to the CMOS reset. So if you need to do a CMOS reset because you push your overclock too far and the system's not booting, you can just press reset on your PC rather than having to open the side panel and bridge that connection. Handy little tip there. So moving along, next we've got a couple of USB 2 ports for the usual kind of things, USB 2 ports for front panel headers, that sort of thing. Or if you wanted to, you could connect up a rear panel to give you a couple more extra USB 2s. Uh, we'll come onto that a little bit later and you'll see why you might want to actually do that. Moving across, we've got two more fan headers. Again, these can be either fans, pumps, or whatever you see fit. They're four pin PWM style connections, so you can pretty much connect up whether you like. This for me actually works out really well. If you've got a case which has got maybe three fans in the front, this is really good. You don't need to use a separate splitter or anything. As long as the cables physically will reach, you can plug one, two, three in the bottom and not have to worry about running cables all around the case. So I really do like the amount of fan headers that ASRock do put on their boards. Moving slightly across, we've got another addressable RGB header. So that's the five volt three pin connection. And next to that, we've got an RGB, normal RGB, 12 volt RGB. So you can plug into there. Got a trusted platform module, if you can plug in there, if uh, you've ever seen one. I personally have never seen one, I've never needed to plug one in, but if you do want to have one, there is an option to plug it in there. Next up, we've got a COM port. So again, a little bit old school, but if you wanted to add a COM port for some reason, for some really old piece of technology, uh, display, whatever it may be, you can use the COM port there. And then also at the very end, we've got our HD audio connector. Now the HD section is all separated, PCB layers wise. So yeah, really nice, clear, sound quality. That is one thing that ASRock boards generally tend to do very well, especially their uh, microphone sources, generally are very, very good. Uh, and again, for the money, you do get that ALC 1200 chipset, which will support up to 7.1 sound, which unfortunately you will not be able to plug into directly uh, because of the way the back panel is set up. So if you did want to use 7.1 audio with the traditional jack plugs, you would actually have to use the rear plugs and also your front panel connectors from the HD audio connector, which is a little bit messy. But personally, I think people that are buying this kind of board, generally, I would say are budget gamers who are most likely to be wearing a headset or some kind of USB DAC, in which case most of that is gonna be irrelevant anyway. But at least it is there, so if you wanted to, you could actually use it. 
So that covers all the connectivity on the board and a quick run through of what is there. Let's take a look at the IO on the rear. So this is where things start to get a little bit on the bland side. So we haven't got a lot here, which makes my life a lot easier, but may make your life a little bit more difficult. So to run through, we've got a combo keyboard port, so that can be used for a keyboard or a mouse. Underneath that, we've got USB 3.2 ports, a pair of. There's an HDMI 1.4 port. Also there is a mounting bracket, so if you wanted to add the Wi-Fi card on at some point, you can route the antenna through to there and fix them onto there, which I may or may not do in the future, and if I do, I'll, uh, I'll do a video to show how it's done. Then you've got another set of USB 3.2 ports, and again, another set of USB 3.2 ports. Above that, you've got the Realtek 8111H gigabit LAN, so for internet connectivity, all that kind of thing, all great. No 2.5 gigabit on this one. Again, it is a budget board, so is it really necessary on that level of board? I personally don't know anyone who actually has 2.5 gigabit network in their house or in their office for that matter, so uh, I don't think that's going to be very missed. What will be missed though is the extra jacks on the audio output. So again, we've got a mic, we've got our earphone, and we've got our line connection. Again, you can choose those, what they are in the actual sound software, so you can configure those however you want to. Again, if you want to use the 7.1 audio or you wanted some kind of sound processing system, yeah, you are very limited on the audio. For me, this is actually perfect because generally I use HDMI audio through my graphics card. Worst case scenario, I'll be using a headset, in which case I'm just going to use the green and the pink connectors for the earphones and for the microphone. So for me, this isn't a problem at all, but again, for some people who are into their audio or need those extra speakers, you may find this a little bit too challenging. Moving around to the back of the board, uh, not much excitement here. All we've got is the standard AM4 backplate. There are actually two screws there, which is nice to see rather than those squeeze clips. This is for the VRM cooler. Now, I did actually remove this and see what's underneath it. And the VRM, again, is a six phase, well, six plus two, making eight virtual phases. And it's using the SM4337 and SM4336 MOSFETs. Uh, that's high and low side. so. Not the best VRM setup in the world, but again, this is a budget board as far as B550 is concerned. I know I keep on saying that, but essentially that is what it is. This, in my opinion, is gonna be the kind of next best thing replacement for the ASRock B450 Pro 4 board. In looks, it looks very similar. In features, it is very, very similar, but you do get that PCI Express 4 and also the support for later and greater chips. As it seems at the moment, there will be beta BIOSes for the older Pro 4 boards and Steel Legends, all that kind of thing, to support some of the latest and greatest chips as they do arrive, the 4000 series. But at least with this, if you're thinking of building a system now, processor-wise, there aren't a lot on the market at the moment. There are either ones which are sky-high expensive, or you've got the lower-end ones like the Ryzen 3 3100, Ryzen 5 3600. Those are the ones which are commonly available on the market at the moment. And for both of those processors, this board is going to be absolutely fantastic and it's going to be a really good foundation to make a really excellent system. Personally, myself, I would rather spend a little bit less on the motherboard and maybe put an extra 20, 30, 40 pounds towards the next tier of graphics card, which to me makes a lot more sense. But again, depending on what features you need from motherboard, that is going to be the question that only you can answer. So that pretty much wraps up the product tour of the ASRock Phantom Gaming 4 B550 chips at motherboard. I personally think this is a winner and hopefully after we've done the installation and done some tests on it, I don't think I'm going to be disappointed. But again, let me know what you think in the comments section. But in the meantime, I've been Mike. This is Mike's Unboxing Reviews and How To and hopefully we'll catch you in the next B550 review. Thanks for watching.